I wasn't sure I was going to do a vlog today because I found out yesterday that my biological father passed away. Very suddenly, he wasn't sick, didn't know that anything was going on, and he's just sadly no longer with us. So, here we But I'm here. I'm doing the makeup look. I'm doing the vlog. Get it. Okay, so before we jump into today's story, I want to say a big thank you to Tasteify for partnering with me on today's episode. I absolutely, absolutely love Tasteify. Tasteify, if you don't know, has a huge selection of curated prints to fit anyone's aesthetic. You can personalize a case with your favorite font and design layout to make a totally unique case to you and your, your own style, you know? Or they have a huge selection of prints and designs to choose from, so you can go that way too. These cases, they also make great gifts for friends and slash or family. Case Defy's new crush cases are made of 65% recycled and plant-based materials. Their re-case Defy technology upcycles end-of-life phone cases to give new life to post-consumer waste. Case Defy crush cases are 100% non-toxic and non-hazardous, I mean, as you'd hope your phone cases. And they feature Defensify, which is an antimicrobial coating, killing 99% of bacteria by preventing the growth of microbes and preventing bacteria from sticking to the surface in the first place. Get your filthy paws off my filthy drawers. The new crush cases are also lined with Caseify's new and improved patent shock absorbing technology, Cheetech 2.0, which offers drop protection of up to 9.8 feet. So your phone, baby girl, is fully protected. Phones are so expensive. Do not be dumb and not protect it. Don't be silly. Cover your willy. Willy being your phone. I was well, there's not much said about anybody's upbringing, so I don't really have much, like, I don't really know. I don't have anything to say, because you know I love a good background story, but what we do know is that Brittany and her husband were living in Fallbrook because it was close to Camp Pendleton, where her husband needed to be because he was in the Marines. So I'm not sure how long they were there for, but at one point he did get deployed to Afghanistan, which like many wives in the situation, it turned out to be super lonely for Brittany. When the two of them got married, I guess she was like 19, 20 years old. So, you know, she was super young. And as time went on, it seems like maybe she just realized that the marine wife life wasn't for her. You know, and that's fair. So in April of 2012, after two years of marriage, Brittany decided to file for divorce. Now, I guess he was deployed at this time. So she was feeling super lonely. And she also wanted to move back home and just be closer to family. I believe leave her home where her friends and family lived was in Missouri but I also saw a uh, different sources say Pennsylvania so I mean two very different places seems so she was going to pack up her stuff and move back home I thought this foundation match is too dark just saying that you know that's just a little bit about Brittany Kilgore and now we're going to talk about three other people and then we're going to circle back to Brittany okay three other people Luis Perez, who was 45 years old, Dorothy Mar Mariglino, 40, and Jessica Lopez, 25. We're going to be talking about these shitheads for a minute. Sorry, but I'm not sorry, because listen. First of all, this guy, Luis Perez, was a staff sh sergeant in the Marine Corps. Terrifying, once you realize how gross these people are. You're nasty. So these three people were active participants in the BDSM lifestyle. I know that you are mature enough to know that this is not a representation of anyone who participates in BDSM, right? Well, maybe you're thinking, but wait, Bailey, I've never heard of BDSM before. What is it? It's an acronym for bondage, discipline, and sadomasochism. It's a lifestyle. But most of all, it's a lifestyle where consenting participants have certain roles like master, slave, mistress, and sometimes they give, um, they get, can give and receive pain during quote unquote play sessions. I mean, you get it, whips of change, maybe not. 
Eric Hall. So these three people were living this lifestyle together and they had their roles as master, mistress, and slave. Now Lewis, he was the master of the situation and Dorothy was his submissive. And this other girl, she was like a little bit newer to the group than the youngest, obviously. Her name's Jessica. Uh, she was Dorothy's slave. She lived with Dorothy at her home in Fallbrook, which Lewis would visit pretty much like all, he pretty much lived there, but he, he lived on base. So Dorothy was someone who would switch often. She would be submissive with Lewis and then dominant with Jessica. Now they kept it kosher and in the house they had a house manual that they followed with like all the rules, okay, of like what they could and could not do. And also a perfect slave checklist and slave contract. Pretty much just showing and agreeing that the parties were consenting again what they agree to what they don't agree to what just all the rules and stuff for them dorothy she would make jessica wear a dog collar like all the time yeah i'm not judging but i mean okay <laughs> she'd make her wear a dog, a dog collar uh because like she, she was her property and she controlled everything jessica did within the home Whereas Lewis was the master and he had control over Dorothy's household, which meant he also had control over Jessica. Are you following? Are you listening? Good, I'm glad you are. So Lewis technically controlled all of them in the house. Okay. Now Lewis over here, he loved inflicting pain on others. And um, in past relationships, it was it was said that he would choke his partners every time they had sex. And he had fantasies about having his partner like abduct a stranger and then forcing them to have sex, AKA the R word that YouTube doesn't like. But I guess this winner over here, Lewis, he loved taking things too far with his partners. And if they wanted out, Lewis wouldn't listen. In other words, he's just a creepy asshole. If you're going to do this shit, the number one rule you gotta follow is that your partner is consenting and Lewis is a piece of shit, you know? Sorry. It's not that hard to be an okay, basic person. So when people do stuff like this, it's just like, why? Why can't you just jerk off or get like a sex doll that you can do things to and like, you're not hurting anybody. Just throwing out ideas, you know? I don't know why he didn't ask me. He should have asked me. I would have been there to help. Like, hey, sex doll, they've come a long way. The boobs, they move, it's wild. Anywho, all three of these people in the household had BDSM abduction, torture, and murder fantasies and milking fantasies. I'm throwing that in there because it brought me back to one of my early murder mystery and makeup episodes, the Robert Woe. Whoa, whoa, episode, which is like just a weird story. This is a side note, I'm sorry. And I'll link it down below if you haven't seen it. But that's where they had like a milking device. And I was like, what's a milking device? Like what? And then I looked it up. Girl, you guys are wild. I learned that day. Yes, I did. I don't think that's for me, but I respect it. So yeah, they have these fantasies. Great. So I guess Lewis and Dorothy did have, like they were a couple but they, they had an open relationship. But it was said that Miss Dorothy, as much as she played along with this open relationship idea, she was very insecure and she believed that Lewis was going to leave her for another woman. So she was paranoid, she was insecure, she was jealous, she was everything. So you got the, the three people there, right? Great. Now we're gonna circle back to Brittany Kilgore. So Brittany had a close friend who also lived in the same apartment complex as her, and her name is Elizabeth Hernandez. Now, Elizabeth became good friends with Dorothy in 2011. So Elizabeth would get invited over to Dorothy's house pretty often. I'm not really sure how they met, but they did. Elizabeth would go over to Dorothy's house and because Brittany was her friend, Brittany would tag along. It was said that neither Brittany nor Elizabeth were involved in like the BDSM lifestyle, but they were aware as to like what was going on in Dorothy's household. And like, they were okay with the situation because it wasn't like, affecting them in the moment. I guess in the beginning, Dorothy, she liked Brittany. She didn't dislike her. I don't know if they had like the best relationship, but they definitely were cordial. But over time, Dorothy got the feeling that Brittany 
was being flirty with her main daddy, Louis. Uh uh, nay nay. And because of this, tensions were a brewing. Dorothy was becoming quite jealous of Brittany and started calling her names behind her back, of course, because she wouldn't do it to her face. So she started referring to Brittany as the disease or the herpes when she wasn't around and she was like talking about her. Just real mature stuff. You think when you ask her yourself, she's totally cool. So based off of phone records, I guess Brittany does end up calling Dorothy around 6 o'clock p.m. And we're not really sure what the what was said in the conversation but it, there was a friend helping Brittany pack and she overheard heard the conversation and she said that they the phone call seemed to like go well because there was laughing Brittany was giggling and just being friendly Brittany tells the friend once the phone calls over that Dorothy couldn't go on the cruise with Lewis because she was pregnant which she was and she knew she would get seasick and just like ruin the whole night it wouldn't be fun so she's like, yeah, you should go. Like, uh, no big deal. You should go. After hanging up the phone, Brittany tells her friend that she was not interested in Lewis, but she felt like this was her last chance to, like, experience that dinner cruise before she moved, and she really wanted to go on it. It seemed like a lot of fun. So at 6.10 p.m., Brittany texts Lewis that she will go with him to the dinner cruise. Lewis is like, yay, and tells her to be ready at 7.30 p.m. and he was going to pick her up. He assured her that like in the morning, his friends would come over and help her move. A side note, the Hornblower cruise left the dock at 7 p.m. So I think it's safe to say that Lewis wasn't planning on taking her on this cruise, okay? Because he's picking her up at 7.30. Before leaving, Brittany left her her friend phone numbers for Lewis and Dorothy because she, I don't know, she just wanted to make sure that she was safe. She was feeling a little unsure about this whole situation. And she's like, here's their numbers just in case. Well, there is surveillance footage that showed Lewis driving up to her apartment complex at 7.36 p.m. And then the two of them drive out of the complex at 7.40. So we know that they left together because it's on video so at 7 50 p.m it's like 10 minutes after Brittany left the apartment complex Brittany's friend the one who was there trying to um, help her pack her name is Channy she receives a text message from Brittany and all it says is help that's all it says and this is like 10 minutes after they left so so around 8 p.m 10 minutes later her friend is trying to call her she calls her numerous times and she's getting no answer at 805 she the friend receives a text message from Brittany that says yes i love this party Brittany's friend instantly knew or she just got like that really weird feeling that it wasn't Brittany who was texting her shortly after she also received text messages from Brittany that again just did not sound like her so the friend kept calling and calling and calling Brittany like fucking answer you know she's like she texts Brittany like I'm calling because I need to hear your voice I need to hear you I'm not gonna do this texting bullshit so the friend received another text from Brittany that said okay music is too loud later on I guess that during the trial Lewis had admitted that he was using Brittany's phone to call her friend while playing loud music from his car to make it seem like she was at a loud party and couldn't talk. Meanwhile, Brittany's friend Elizabeth, the one who introduced her to the group of friends, she got word that like something was up with Brittany. Elizabeth calls up Dorothy. Hello, what's going on? What's going on? I'm hearing like Brittany texted help. You know, I know she's with you guys. What's going on? And Dorothy said that she had not spoken to Brittany and had no idea like what she was talking about. Brittany's friend calls up Lewis's phone and asks him, like, what the hell is going on? Can't get a hold of Brittany. We're worried. Lewis tells this friend on the phone that he took Brittany downtown to, like, some club. She started talking to some guy, and he left her there, and that was the last time he saw her. At this point, cell phone records showed that Lewis was at Dorothy's house this whole time, pretty much. Like, he left... Brittany's house and then went to Dorothy's house. So Dorothy is telling Lewis like, hey, I worked for a cell phone company. Cell phones are traceable. They can detect where you're at because of the cell towers. She's telling this to Lewis. So Lewis, this is 
just like <laughs> stupid ass. I'm sorry, but like he is. Like he's so fucking stupid. He's like, well, oh my god, like phones are traceable. So Lewis is like, okay, in order for my story to make sense, I need to take Britney's cell phone to downtown San Diego and like dump it so it lines up with his story. But his dumbass didn't realize that like the phone showed that he went to Dorothy's house, then drove downtown San Diego, dropped the phone, and then they could track they being like police. They could track Lewis's phone and see that he drove back to Dorothy's house. Cell phone data showed My Lewis and hurt. slave girl Jessica pissing phone me off today. at one point moving east towards Temecula in the early hours of April 14th. Now their phones there were traced anyone. to Lake I don't know what Skinner, the fuck happened, but... and they were there for quite some time. And then the phones moved back to Dorothy's house. Just a bunch of dumbasses because Dorothy literally told them that cell phones are traceable and they take their phones off with them on this mission. Just like great listening skills, daddy. Well, on April 14th, Elizabeth, Brittany's friend, remember, she calls up Dorothy. She's like, look, I know you have spoken to Brittany. What's going on? And I guess Dorothy gets all flustered and starts stuttering. She's like, yeah, uh, I, well, you know, she will, well, she won it. And then she like gives the phone to Lewis, who then tells Elizabeth, I guess like three different versions as to what happened that previous night. Nothing was making sense. Nothing was lining up and nobody had like a clear answer as to where was, where was Brittany? It shouldn't be that difficult, right? Exactly. So after all of this commotion, the police were contacted. Police ended up reaching out to Lewis, who seemed panicky, but he agreed to come talk to police in person. So my nose is running and I just spat on my face. Okay, great. So Lewis comes down to the um, police department and it's noted that like, mm, his story seems to flip flop. He doesn't have a clear answer as to like, where Brittany is, okay? I won't waste my time on what Lewis's excuses were, but what police did notice right away was that his car was caked with like fresh mud. He's like, do you live on a muddy road or something? No, nay, nay, Lewis says, nay. So police are like, okay, noted, like fresh mud on his car, missing girl, interesting. So Lewis had agreed for police to search his car. And then Lewis was placed under arrest when they found an unlawful weapon inside his vehicle. I'm not 100% sure what it was, but I'm assuming, this is an assumption, I'm assuming it was the taser, which I'll talk about, but I'm not 100% sure. He was placed under arrest. So then police go down to Miss Dorothy's home and they perform a search there. So police had noticed, well, first of all, nobody was home. Interesting, right? And police had noticed that some items in the home seemed to be missing. Like they just could tell things, there were gaps in certain areas. Interesting, right? They also noticed that the house Hello? Very interesting that they did not come home that evening. So police are like, well, we gotta locate these bitches. So they tried to locate um, Dorothy's vehicle by looking up her license plate and whatnot. And they're able to locate uh, Dorothy's vehicle on April 17th at a hotel parking lot near the um, San Diego airport. Seems like she's making a run for it. Skinamarinky dinky dink, skinamarinky do. I found you. So police go down to the hotel where um, Dorothy's vehicle was at, right? They go to the hotel, they go to the front desk. They're able to find the room which these idiots are registered for the night because it's under their name. Great, easy, easy, love that. Police, knock, 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 on the hotel door. Now, weird, weird thing happens, let me tell you. Jessica, remember Jessica? She answers the door. Now it has a chain lock on the door, so it's like they can't open it all the way, right? So she's kind of peeking out. She's like, I help you? Police notice that Jessica seems to be breathing like very slow, slowly. And she's like trying to tell police that everything's fine, but they uh, are kind of looking, trying to see behind her and whatnot. And um, that's when they notice blood on the floor behind her. So police, you know, just like kick down the door, whatever they do. And they go into the hotel room. And that's when they find, like, this is bizarre. This is where it gets really kind of weird. 
they find Jessica in the room, right? She's half naked and she's bleeding at her from her neck. She has a cut across her neck. It was a suicide attempt. In the room, police also find a handwritten confession letter by Jessica with a sign that says, quote, pigs breed this, end quote. So I'm sure that was really awkward, right? She's like, oh my God, I wasn't calling you guys pigs. I thought I wasn't gonna be here when you guys read that. It's just bird looks. So in the letter, Jessica took complete responsibility for Brittany's death saying that she alone, she only and she alone had grabbed Brittany, slammed her body into the stairs. So this is the look I created for wrist, District 3, mouth, which is, taser, like I said, electricity her, and technology. Rope, sorry, it's technology. I don't know what and cut her body and I chose tools. red, blue, and yellow Doused because these are the colors of wires bleach, that are used to hook things up. So that's the color this is what the segment you're getting for today. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. And as always, make the best choices for you and, and your life.